Okay, hey guys, welcome back to Golden Aesthetics. Today is a very special day. I'm here uh, with one and only Tom Platts. Tom, thank you so much for doing this. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure. It, it really is. I'm, I was driving here and I'm nervous. I'm really still <laughs> nervous right now because this is a very big thing for me. As I, I, I told you, I, I grew up in Russia and I was looking at your photos when I was six years old. And now I'm here doing this interview. So I'm very excited and I'm very excited to share you with your fans around the world because uh, they're thirsty for knowledge. The bodybuilding is changing and you're, you're one of the biggest and prominent legends of, of golden era of bodybuilding. So thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm one of the guys who are still alive. You know? Yes, so, you will be alive even when you're gone because uh, we're going to carry on your legacy and your knowledge. Um, I prepared some questions for you because I, I put on Instagram and there was a lot of people that are still remember you and follow you and um, they, they, they ask a lot of questions, I pick the best ones. So we're going to start with um, how did you get into the sport of bodybuilding, what was your motivation and how it started for you and how old were you? Were? I was nine, nine years old and I went into a drug store where I used to live, this place called Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a little town called Melville. And I went in the drugstore and I saw this muscle bodybuilding and power magazine. Before muscle and fitness, it was called bodybuilding and power. And I think so, bodybuilding and power. Yeah, I think something like that. But I was looking through the magazine, I was nine. And I'm like, wow, I'm just like mesmerized. Dave Draper, the blonde hair, yeah. girls on each arm, girls on each leg. And then Arnold, of course, drinking protein out of the blender. And uh, I was like, I, I couldn't breathe for a second, you know? I thought, my God, what a job. What a great job this would be. <laughs> you know, live in, Cal uh, in California was 3,000 miles away. And I never saw California. I never saw the beach. I, I saw the snow, you know, in, in Pittsburgh. You know, it was a steel mill kind of city. Everybody worked uh -huh. hard, you know. And the guys drank beer at night. And life was good, you know. And that was the kind of uh, working class environment that I was raised in. But I thought, what a dream to be in California, to have girls like that, and to have surfboards in the hey, you are only nine years old. Yeah, and it's Corvettes were in the picture, remember? Joe Weider painted this picture of what California was from his point of view. And I bought in right away, right away. I'm like, Dad, when I grow up, that's what I want to do. And Dave Draper, this Weider Crusher thing, and the girls here. And uh, I thought, that's what I'm gonna do. And it just, my whole life changed. And Artie Zeller took that pe picture. Artie Zeller, a great photographer. He took pictures of all of us, you know. He passed away a few years ago, but when I, I told myself, most importantly, I made a self-promise to, to Tom, when I grow up, that's what I'm gonna do. And, it, it, you know, and I told my dad this, my dad's like, sure, whatever, <laughs> you know, let's go home. Yeah. And he didn't buy the magazine for me, he put it back on the rack, and we went home. But I never thought of, I never forgot about it. I would look out my window and look at the snow and go, pretend it's sand. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. and so how did the, the how did you go to the gym? What when when did that start and how? Uh, you know, I was pretty young, so I couldn't get into gyms. I didn't even know any gyms were. But uh, my dad bought me this set of weights for mm -hmm. Christmas, like a 90, 110 pound set. And I, I'm thinking, all right, this is the answer to my dream. I have to read the instruction book, and I, you know, I'm like, my dad would go downstairs after dinner with me and. He goes, okay, the first exercise is the bench press. I'm like, okay, what's, what do you do? He goes, well, you lay down on the floor and you gotta push this bar. And my elbows would hit the, hit the ground. Yeah. I'm like, this, and then we figured out you have to have a bench. So we rigged up this bench and every night after dinner, we would do different exercises. But, but I, I knew, it was weird because, you know, I always wonder why did a, why would a priest become a priest? And that's a hell of a commitment. Why would a nun become a nun? But there was no choice for me. I mean, there was absolutely no choice. I was going to go to California, and I was going to learn how to do it all before I went there. I remember, I remember going in the bathroom going, Hey, Mom, I look like these guys, don't I? And I was <laughs> like nine. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> but there was no choice. There was no what if, no plan B. Forget plan B. This was the only thing that mattered in my life. It was the most important thing. It was like being a priest. And what I imagined, why a priest would become a priest. I know you thought about becoming a priest. Yeah, I was, but you didn't, don't tell him that. Okay, don't <laughs> that. I thought about no, it No, it's all good. <laughs> but I kind of became a priest in a way. Yeah. yeah. We're all priests in a way. Yes. I mean, we all came out here to California like, an, like anointed zombies. We came walking out here with no money, and, and no, no really understanding of the future other than just a dream. We, we needed to be together and train. Yeah. That's all we knew. 
I think there were three girls and nine or six, nine or ten guys. And that was it. That was bodybuilding in, in its infancy. It wow. Was, it was wonderful. Well, wow. how was uh, how was what was bodybuilding for you back then when you were starting out in your vision and how it changed and and what do you think about it as now? Because I'm sure you went through a transitioning, you know, through the mental understanding and, and spiritual understanding of bodybuilding. What was it for you at the beginning of your career, during the career and now? When I first came to California, we all went to the beach. The beach was the same as the gym. I mean, you went to the gym for two hours in the morning, then we had breakfast together, and we went to the beach together all day. And some of us came back to the gym to, to train again, and I'm like, that's crazy. I'm going to go home and relax and get ready for yeah. the morning. Uh, but the, the, the beach was an extension of the gym. It, it wasn't like, you know, you went to a suntan bed or, or waited till the night before to put, you know, tanning stuff on or yeah. sprayed. Uh, that we didn't have any of that stuff. And, and every day, we would go to the beach and go to the gym. It was part of the condition. That's why they have the Olympia in September. Because July, August, or June, July, August, we could lay in the sun every day for three hours. And my skin was like saran wrap. I would go, you know, Zane, yeah. Zane taught me this. Baby oil and iodine on my skin. I looked like I was ready for the stage any second. A statue. Oh, and you walk on the, you walk to the beach. Everything was ready, and I was ready within ten or twelve pounds to get on the stage at any moment. So by the time the show came, that was like perfect. I mean, you could just everything was there. Every night I would wax, put the Nivea cream in my skin, and spend an hour getting ready for the next day. <laughs> I wasn't like you know. This I was is like cool. White and hairy. I was this is in cool. shape every day. The skin was always every Saturday. I shaved my legs for an hour. One of my I hated to do. I, I've seen one of the photos when you walk in the beach and everybody's looking at you. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty pretty famous photo. I never thought about that. Just no, of cool. course. Yeah, I don't think you do it for that reason. It, you know, that far in your career, I don't think you even start. People that achieve something in this sport, they don't start it start it selfishly. I think they look at it a little bit different than it's, other. It's a spiritual. Yes, connection. very. To the, to the gym and the beach and the, the camaraderie. I mean, I remember going to the, this place called German's Restaurant for a buck and a half after the gym. We could get six eggs, you know, and uh, Robbie would go. Robbie never talked. Mm -hmm. Robbie would sit there like this, and, you know, he'd eat quietly and leave. I'm like, wow, how does he look like that? Never even eats. He would eat half the, half the omelet, push it away, and leave. Wow. I'm like, wow, how does he get so big, you know? And Robbie had the ripped up tank top, like sort of like yours. Yeah, yeah, he has he a style. He has a swag even right now. If you see him at the gym, he's still yeah. wearing his sunglasses. He's still in his own. Well, as a, <laughs> as a, I used to watch him. These are all the guys I watched mm -hmm. when I was a little kid. Robbie was the guy. Yeah. Okay, and I would come in the gym. When I walked in the gym, he had this cut up tank top and he was underneath the skylight. And I'm like, oh my God, my breath got taken away. I'm like, I'm staying here for no yeah, matter what. He's probably one of the most beautiful physiques oh, ever. He would walk. It was like a style to him. He still has that. Yeah, he does that. Movement. Yes, he does. And I just can't be, I thought to myself, I can't just be a, you know, this kid with muscle. I've got to be more than that. I've got to emulate that what Robbie has, what Zane has, what Arnold had. Yeah. You know, and you, you sort of learn that you're, you're more than just a bodybuilder. There's a connection and a movement pattern and a, and a class about these guys that I go, that's what I'm looking for. I have to learn how to do that. And Robbie was, you know, didn't talk, but he taught me. Zane top. They all like welcome to the club, kid. Okay, we're gonna show you how to This do is it. so cool. You know, it was, it was this is, back then. The, this is so cool. Tops and we, yeah. didn't, we didn't hide in our clothes, you know, and it was all about the camaraderie and the love of the game. Okay, money didn't come into it later. You were not really competing to with each other, we're more challenging each other than uh, well, no. you know, we were competing with each other, but still it's like you know, every every weekend somebody was winning something. Mm -hmm. And when you're around that environment you're, you expect to win something too. Yeah. Next time it's my turn, and I did. And pretty soon we all went to the Olympia together. And you know, at first I was like, "Wow!" I'm at the Olympia in 1979 after I won the universe in '78. I'm like, oh, "I'm on the Olympia stage with the best in the world." Holy smokes! I'm not ready for this yet. It wasn't until '81 I go, "Okay, here I am. I'm here to do business, guys. I love y'all. You're my butt. You're my reason I'm here." But it's time for me to take to, to take my spot. This is your time. Yeah, and, and I knew that. I knew it. They knew it. You know, and we all had that time. Okay, and but I, I can tell you, man. I used to watch Robbie train back. I was like, and even today, I'm like, wow. We had this movement pattern that I, I tried to emulate. And people said that about my squats. And mm -hmm. I used to watch Arnold do curls and go, aha, that's it. And nobody ever lifted gigantic weights. You know, Robbie would. You know, rarely did I see any of the top guys when I was a kid 
lift more than a 40 pound dumbbell for arms for curls. That was it. But it was the way and the style and the movement and the, the connection. I mean, it was like the mental aspect of it was in it. You just walked into the old old gold's gym. You opened the door and you grew just by opening the door. <laughs> <laughs> quite different nowadays. Very now quite. It's like about this and that. How was how was your diet when you started out training, and how did it change? Because a lot of people right now they think that there is some kind of a secret to it. How how did you guys eat back then? Well, back then we were all on meat and water. We ate steak and tuna and eggs and water, and carbs were very limited. And then uh, around 1980, you know, the 1979 Olympia, the 1980 Olympia. That's how I ate. But it wasn't until '81 I go. Okay, I gotta come into my own. I need carbs for the fullness. And I realized after spending a great deal of time with the great Mike Menser, he was a friend of mine also, mm -hmm. taught me a lot. And he said, you know, you, you need carbs. As long as you limit your calories and eat the carbs, you can maintain the fullness that you need, Tom. I'm like, I gotta do something different. I knew that I had to do something different. Uh, so I tried it. And I was eating 300 grams of carbs in 81, thinking, oh my God, I can't get in shape eating 300 grams of carbs. But you know what? Six weeks before the show, I'm like, big and full and strong and striated and in shape. I'm like, I, I can do this. And so up until the 81 Olympia, I was all you know, meat and water mm -hmm. and really low carbs. But when I finally decided to switch metabolisms, I think that's one of the secrets, to switch metabolisms and eat carbs, man, all of a sudden I'm weighing more, looking bigger, looking fuller, and still in the kind of condition that I wanted. And, but I limited my calories. Do you think your body reacted to this because you were on low carbs before? Otherwise, it wouldn't do the trick. Because in 82, 3, 4, 5, 6, it sort of leveled off. And I was big and full, but not like 81. 81, I was like, my skin was like saran wrap. All of a sudden, it was like, boom! People thought, my God, he must be doing something magical, something that nobody else has, he must be taking. I was eating, I was eating toast in the morning and Pop-Tarts. Okay, that was my <laughs> The chocolate ones. <laughs> love the fat. A lot of people will go around right now and buy some Pop-Tarts. Hey, Actually, my, my trainer partner used to do that. He used to come to the gym with a box of Pop-Tarts. He said, is this the right kind, Tom? I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> how, did you, how did your legs respond? Were the, was it your genetic just strong point or that's something that you figured out was just squatting? Well, I didn't come out of the womb with cross striations. I didn't have big legs when I was a kid. When I was in high school, I was known as the guy with big upper body and tiny legs. Seriously. Mm -hmm. And um, as I went on in my career, uh, I started training. I started training with 90 pounds when I was younger and 135 pounds. Uh, and I, I really didn't come into my own. It just sort of happened by itself. In fact, I even, like in 80, 80, 79, 80, 1980, I started doing less squats thinking that I'll play my upper body, my lower body down and focus on my upper body. You know what happened? <laughs> my legs got bigger. Boom! You know? And Zane, Zane, was, Zane told me, he goes, Tom, this is your ticket. He said, this is, none of us have legs like that. This is very, you're very different this way. This is what you should market. And I'm thinking, really, Frank? You think so? He goes, yeah. No, but he was my teacher. Mm -hmm. These guys were my teachers. They're all 15 years, yeah. 10 years older than me. And they took me under their wing and they said, okay, kid. You know, I was like the little kid, the dream. I'm gonna do this no matter what. I don't care who says I'm not good enough. I'm good enough, let me show you. And they they saw that. They go, come here. You know, and then when I would squat with them, they're like, you're crazy, man. You know, but they, I would do arms with them and chest with them and uh -huh. they would do legs with me, but they showed me the way. And I have to pay respect to Frank and Arnold and, and you know, and, and guys like this and Robbie. Yeah. And I was in the hospital and I had a bicep tear in 82. You know, I was in the hospital and I had my, my uh, uh, what do you call it, my appendix burst in uh -huh. the hospital. And Robbie never spoke to me till this time. Robbie came to the hospital at night. It was like dark. I don't wow. know how he got in. He'd go, oh, a real low, deep voice. I don't know if you ever talked to him. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like, yes, he yes. He should be a singer or something. Yes. Yeah. And he walked in my room in the hospital when I was recovering from uh, this arm operation. He goes, you're going to train arms with me. We'll train. We'll train. You're going to be fine. I'm like. Wow, Robbie Robinson walked in my hospital room. Maybe I'm just on too many painkillers, you know? Yeah. It couldn't have happened, but he spoke to me, uh, like, and welcomed me to the club. Yeah. And he goes, you're going to be fine. I'm like, wow, I guess I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm the famous guy now. Because I was around all these guys and, yeah. and looking for my position, you know, as a teenager. 
but uh, when Robbie came into my hospital room and I don't know how he got in. I don't know how he got in so it was like 10, 10 11 at night. Visiting hours were over, but he came in. Like a priest. Yeah. <laughs> like a shadow, you know. You know and I, but then I knew. I go, I'm here. And this is, I'm going to stay here, and this is my life. This is going to be my life. And I always knew it. And I was always convinced beyond any reason of a doubt. You know, and I just knew that this is what I was supposed to do with my life. How did you turn your biceps? I was doing flies in prepar preparation for the 82 Mr. Olympia in London. And all of a sudden, I felt this, I'm like, ooh, it's a weird feeling. So I put the dumbbell down, go, let's, let's, let's keep going. Oh, I, go, I can't do it. So I called Ken Waller. And Ken uh -huh. Waller had a tricep tear. I go, yeah. Ken, who's your doctor? I got to go see him right now. And he goes, okay, uh, Barry, I forget Barry's last name, but he told me his doctor's number and his name. And I went to see him. And he goes, it's completely ruptured, Tom. You can't train for the 82 Olympia. I'm like, forget that. I got six weeks, six weeks to go. It's my turn, you know? And, and I go, okay. So I went to the next doctor on the other side of the street. He said the same thing. He goes, it's completely ruptured. Because if you think you could train and compete in six weeks, hey, give it a shot. I'm like, okay, that's all I needed to hear. I needed to have somebody give me that positive thought. Yeah. So, you know, I, and I called Mike Menzer and I said, Mike, I can't train uh, back anymore because I can't pull, I can't do biceps. He goes, I'm going to show you what, what Arthur Jones taught me on Nautilus. And Casey Vieter helped me out. They all showed me how to do back work without bringing the biceps into play. So they showed me these Nautilus things, and which I really didn't like because I was a free weight guy. Yeah. But I learned about Nautilus because out of necessity. So you trained with a torn biceps? Yeah, I did. And, and I, For how long? Six weeks. I mean, there's only a month left, and the last two weeks you float it in, you yeah. in condition. And nobody wow. noticed it. Nobody saw it except for, I told a couple guys out here, and they uh -huh. knew about it. And of course, all the judges are like in 82 in London. They're like, Tom, front bicep, please. I'm like, oh, no. Because I could hide it. I could hide it so good, nobody could see it. Uh -huh. and it was starting to move up, you know? Yeah. But I could pose with it to where they didn't and emphasize other things to wow. distract them. This but, is so crazy. But they asked for This me. is so crazy. I couldn't, I couldn't get out. So finally, <laughs> I think I placed fifth or sixth that year. And I decided all the pro shows, I was in a guest pose. And, here. and all the promoters said, okay, fine, Tom, come on in, guest pose. And it was fine. Yeah. I got to open the show and, and guest pose. And I think I had my mom with me. You know, she was like, you know, she was still wanted to travel to Europe. And I lived in Europe. Europe was my backyard. That's where I was at the most popularity, I think still to this day. Uh, my book was released in Europe first rather than the United mm -hmm. States. All the promoters knew that. I would go to Europe four months out of the year and guest pose and do a summer every night. It was like, it's like home, it's like my people. I didn't, you know, people said to me, they go, why did you tr guest pose and do so many seminars if you really wanted to win the Olympia that bad? And I'm thinking, I just couldn't stay home and train and win the Olympia. I had to be out amongst the people. I had to be shaking hands and, and talking to people. And sharing knowledge yeah. and expiring, yeah. And, and that to me was the Olympia. You know, I wanted to that. I wanted to be on stage every night. I wanted to be on a different gym every morning. I wanted to do that for months at a time, and I, I did. And every weekend I had the opportunity to do that and get paid very well. So, and, and it wasn't about the money though. It was about the love of the game. And I wanted to, to do those kind of things. How did you develop this, this the squat rack religion because I heard you talking that it's a separate sport yeah, yeah. how did it become a separate sport for you well you know I responded very well to very hard squatting okay I wasn't good at reps I was a power lifter at heart I was, I was supposed to be a power a low rep guy but all of a sudden uh, when I started practicing on reps I knew I could do it. You know, 15 reps with 315, and then pretty soon it was 315 for 50 reps, and it was 405 for 50 reps, and then it was 500 pounds for 25 reps, and then all these numbers. I, it was like that was like a special game, a special sport. And so everybody would gather around on squat day and just watch the squat. Yeah. And they like squat with me, and like, you can do it, you can do it, you own this movement. Tony used to, my old training partner, Tony, uh -huh. you own the squat. Yes, Tony, I do. Okay, you know I would believe what he said. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I, I had the right degree of ankle flexibility. I was blessed with genetics, yes, the de degree of ankle flexibility, low center of gravity. Plus, I was taught by the best in the world. When I was a, when I was a little kid in Detroit, I mean, Norbert Shemansky uh, was influenced me and taught me how to squat. His, one of his disciples and uh, top weightlifting coaches, and Bob Morris, they would write down, I, was, oh, I shouldn't have been in the gym at age 15, because I wasn't legal and I couldn't get into the gym. But they, they would put the weights on for me and say, do this kid, do that kid. We're not going to show you how to squat unless you get a good pair of shoes. Go out and get a pair of squat shoes first. Yes, sir. And when I got a pair of squat shoes and came back and 
all right, let's show them how to squat. And they showed me how to squat. It was, you know, your back was straight. It was all quad dominant movement. And I incorporated that into my training when I came to California. Nobody squatted back then, really. I mean, Ed and Arnold did for pumping iron, but you know, nobody really, they used to store benches underneath the squat. Yeah, and it still looked very light. He was squatting with what, three plates? Yeah, you know, so, yeah. and I saw Eddie do, Eddie influenced me, Eddie Corny. I'm like, okay, if he can do 315 for 15, I'm going to California, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show him how it's done, you know? Because uh -huh. I was trained by the best weightlifters in the world. And uh, so when I went to California and, uh, you know, squatted there, even even now, I was just telling Shaw, I said, I'd like to go back to Golds. And I, because I miss that same squat rack, squatting in the same place for all through the 70s and the 80s. And I go back to him like, wow. I can imagine, I got goosebumps, you know? yeah, flashbacks. But uh, that's what it was for me. It became a special movement. And because nobody really did it. But when I did it, they did it with me. And it became that special day where you cheer each other on. And, yeah. I mean, do reps that nobody, nobody. Yeah, it's a very before. yeah. If if you trained hard, you go deep. And the camaraderie, yeah. It, and the spirit of it is like, it's, you know, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to squat. I still get anxious talking about it, you know. And every day when I still squat, not every day, but every other week, it's it's you get anxious. You get scared. You know, it's a scary thing to put a lot of weight on your back for a lot of reps, and it, it really, it really makes you go there, go the distance. You know? Yes but I, I could never leave the gym a loser. I knew I had a, I would have my mind going to the gym, I'm gonna do this many reps with this much weight. And I had to make it happen. I had to make it a reality. And when I leave, when you leave the gym and you accomplish that many reps with that much weight, it's like, life is great. I, it's the best drug in the world. It's not that I like squatting that much, I just like the feeling afterwards. Of accomplishment. Oh, I mean, imagine you know, doing 500 pounds yeah. for like, I don't know, I never counted. My my part, training partners did. So you didn't count the reps? No, I could never. I could when I did 405 for 50. I could I could never imagine. Oh, that's too many reps to think about. I can't manage that. But I can manage five at a time. So every five, I would do five reps, and Tony would say five. Okay, Tony, say ten when I get ten. Ten. He would say fifteen, and then he'd say twenty, and then we say twenty-five. Well, I'm halfway done. You know, I can get fifty. You know, and he would they would do this for me. But I could manage five reps at a time. I couldn't manage 50 reps at a time, in my mind. But once I get five, it's like, it's like doing sets of five, you know, 50, 10 times, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> this is so crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all in game, it's a mind yeah. game. And if you think you can do it, you can. If you think you could win the show, you can. When you walk on stage, you've got to give that feeling to the audience. And Tom, you are a legend. I never heard anyone talking like ah, that. No, I'm serious. I, I, I'd never experienced, um, you know, human beings like you, because you, you have a, a totally different mentality. Um, and that way, I guess, sets you apart from the rest of the bodybuilders. You, you know, everybody, you know, from that era, you're right. They have their own feel and their own charisma, yeah. you know, their own aspect. There is something about them I instead of just being plain and just a bunch of muscles. There was a personality mm -hmm. to it. And every, every single body looked different and artistic yeah. in a way. And, and talking to you right now, learning and seeing how much more goes into bodybuilding than just lifting weights, taking drugs and eating enormous amount of food. Yes, and, and hearing stuff. your approach, it, it's the, there's no question you are a legend, and it, 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 it truly, really, the squatting is probably one of the hardest exercises and the gnarliest workouts ever. This is the only time when I puke, if I if I push myself on on, on the leg day. I mean, it, it takes you for a ride. I mean, you know, you, and you find out, you know, how much. You guts you really have and it's yes it tests your limits it's the only sport you're not trying to dominate someone else you're just trying to dominate yourself yes that's scary just saying that that's why you feel happy when you really dominated yourself when i used to go to the car and fall into my corvette you know and barely be able to walk it was like i could do anything i realized and i tell i tell the guys i work out i work out with now if you can do this you can do anything i don't care what it is in fact i would say this the squat is this training you know imitate life or does life imitate the squat rack it's like there's no answer for that but it, it really does i mean if you can squat and really put it together i mean that answers all your problems it really does because you can translate that to anything and i always tell the guys i train with there's five more reps in the gym there's always five reps i don't care how beat up you are i don't care how tired you are you got five reps the same in life there's five reps left in business you know this better than yes. anybody there's Absolutely. always five reps left absolutely so that's what the squat was for me. It was more the religion. 
more of a technical question. Uh, a lot of people asking what legs respond better to heavy weights and less sat, I mean reps or, or less weight and more reps. did a uh, podcast the other day on this very subject. You've got to do both. You've got to do the heavy, low reps. And you've got to do the reps too. But the reps are far more important than the heavy weights. But the challenge now is to do really heavy weights for a lot of reps. And that's what you have to figure out. I mean, how do you do 405 to 50 reps? For, or for at least 10 or 15. I watched Zane do 405 or 10. Small guy. Yeah. And I used to watch him do sit-ups and these Roman shirt with like wrap around sunglasses. He'd do sit-ups one set for an hour. When I first came to California, I'm like, oh my God. One set for an hour. An hour, an hour one set of sit-ups. And I'm like, I'm like a teenager going, these guys aren't from the earth. Wow. Zane must be from a different planet, obviously. <laughs> he looks okay. like that. And yeah. then, so I figured the squat, you know, and I never really thought about the squat being mine, but I figured, you know, this is, I'm going to own this. I'm good at this. I can do a lot of weight for a lot of reps. You know, and, and people started recognizing me for that. I walked on stage, and I remember one day I was, I had a brand new pair of sweats on, and I had oil on my skin, and it was like lint, little pieces of yeah. sweats. So I, I go, i got to dust it off before I hit my leg shot. And so people thought that was part of my act. So every time I guest pose and every 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 uh, yes, <laughs> I dusted my leg for it, then snapped. You know, all oh, people thought that was part of my act. Yeah, you know, I became known for that movement. I don't know how it happened. It was a, it was a gift. It was a gift from God, because I wasn't the, the most symmetrical guy with a tiny waist like yourself. I was just I was this white kid from back east, working class white kid who believed he could do it, and I, and I had no question that I could do it. And people used to you all think, oh yeah, he's not he's not Arnold. I go, and I never thought I was Arnold. I just thought I'm me, and I had something, and I could put it. I knew I could put it together. I knew I had to do it. And I think when a, a Menser and Vieter used to walk by me training, they're like, oh my God, this kid's nuts. He won't stop. And I, I guess that was the intensity of training. I, I knew that, you know, that I had to do this. I had to train like this to develop a kind of body that was different than everybody else. When I walked on stage with legs, I think most of the judges were like. How do we judge this? We never saw legs like this. Arnold doesn't have the status quo. It was beyond the status quo. They didn't know what to do with me. So um, right away, I established this this entity of yes. being you know, Tom Platts, the guy with the legs, and it never went away. When I tried to make it go away, it got, it got, they got better. Tom, do you think that heavy squats, do they thicken your... You gotta if, do both. If they're not, I'm, I'm talking about heavy squats, do they thicken your waist? Because well, there's a lot of, actually I talked to Frank Zane and he told me that he wouldn't squat heavy because it will get his obliques really thick. To some degree, there's some truth in that. But I think a lot of it is the technique. Because if you have a quad dominant squat and you keep your waist small and, and use your quads only without your lower back and your, your waist area, you can get a, the, the legs without the obliques. Mm -hmm. You can do it. Okay? And, just that most people, most guys and most girls don't squat like I'm talking about. They, they have a lot of girls squat for their buttocks. I get that. I understand. I finally figured out, okay, that's what they're doing. But people lean over and, and they, they use something, a technique that's not pure. The pure technique will lead to quad development and shape galore. I guarantee you. You know, I, I tell some of the girls I know, go, just squat, just squat. With no way. All of a sudden they're like, oh my God, it's coming together. It's happening. You got to squat. And squatting was for me, for most people, it's the, one of the keys to success. I really believe. That. I think when you squat, the the whole body catches up to you as well. You and know? sometimes you hit a plateau, and you try to work your upper body, and it's not growing. But the, the you gotta hit the legs heavier and harder to your upper body to actually start growing and, and to break through the plateau and go to an anabolic state again. You know, especially like we used to do like sets of three and sets of five and sets of six and sets of eight. Okay, but then on the other days would be like at least 15 sets, at least 15 reps. And then I, we start proposing, well, if we can do 15, why not 20? If we can do 20, why not 30? If we can do 30, how about 50 reps a set? And that became very challenging. I mean, 50 reps a set, how, how do you manage that? Especially with a lot of weight. And that's the key, getting a lot of weight and really doing the reps and not stopping to where it gets hard. You know, people say it's overtraining nowadays, you know, and listening to you and, and reading more of an old school approach, there was a lot more volume and a lot more challenge and more diversity. Most modern day bodybuilders don't put the effort into figuring what works. They just figure they'll eat this or take that and they'll get this result. And, and as a result, you know, the, the, 
physiques are looking similar. Everybody's physique looks round and full. It's interesting. But that's it's freaky. Yeah. It's freaky. It's more of a freak show, more of entertainment because you don't see those things every day. It's like looking at the at the movie, you know, at the fantasy, like a like a cost, like a like a little book, you know. But bodybuilding, looking at you, or looking at the bodybuilders from old school, there was art to it. And, I, more art. and you can you can see that that's why you were more involved mentally because when you work as an artist it's it's all happening in your head first and then it comes into play in reality so it, that's what so I guess thing is, most bodybuilders do what Dorian did Dory opened the door Dorian Yates opened the door for what's the current scene if you will um, in the old days we were all not really following anyone we were creating our own path and you know, you, you can follow somebody else and be a soldier, and that's respectable. I, I, I respect that. But there are a few people, a few athletes, a few artists who create something from within. And to innately or intrinsically pull something out of yourself and paint it or sculpt it or change your body accordingly, that's art. That's, as well, that's, what, that's your closest connection to God, okay? And most bodybuilders don't go there anymore. They're just doing what Dorian did or doing what Ronnie did uh, or doing what Jay did. Without real connection to inner, yeah. inner being. Well, to respect these guys. And these Absolutely, people. they're hardworking people. Absolutely. Absolutely, there is no question. Yes, this, this, the approach is different. It just got lost somewhere, yeah, some in the way. And I feel what's happening right now, people are thirsty for that because it, it truly expresses who we are. I, I agree. It, everything comes back. I mean, bell bottoms came back, uh, you know, and I think that <laughs> <laughs> they came back twice, I think. Yeah. But I think that, the, I think young bodybuilders will start realizing this again some they already do they already everybody's looking back now yeah. because it's beautiful yeah. and anybody can relate that a human eye can relate to the beauty to aesthetics you, when you when you see it you know it's beautiful you you have that inside you can resonance that yeah yeah um, not that i feel like my grandfather back in my day we we didn't wear shoes on the way to school we had to walk with you know it, yeah in, in a way you know i i don't want to say our day was better it was interesting. It was different. Uh, I got to tell you, though, a lot of the old guys uh, who I used to admire their time, like the 50s, Muscle Beach in the 40s and the 50s, what was that like? They used to tell me about stories, and they would say the 80s were the best time. I'm like, you think so? You know, and we had no idea it was the golden era in 1980. We didn't know that. It yeah, I understand. It was just by the building. It was one Gold's Gym. Yeah. It was one Gold's Gym. We all went to that one Gold's Gym. We all came here from all over the world to train at that one gym. I remember when they they were uh, selling the gym, they offered me half ownership for 20 I turned pro in 1979. I, I made 40 grand in 1979, which is a lot of money. Yeah. You know, my first year as a pro. And I could have gave them 20 grand and owned half of Gold's Gym's enterprises. I thought, no, I'm going to buy Corvette instead. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. Uh, 15 years later, 15 years later, yeah, right? my neighbor goes, Tom, I have an idea for a coffee shop. I go, coffee? I'm not going to invest money in a coffee shop. You can buy coffee at Denny's. Nobody, nobody called it a coffee shop? God. Starbucks. <laughs> I never had the vision. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. Uh, uh, Arnold had that vision. He was buying property in Venice, California when it was a dump, a hole in a wall. He knew that he could see the vision. Uh, guys like Vince McMahon had the vision for wrestling. Yeah, it's hard to combine bodybuilding and business. You, you know, you've got to have the vision as well to it. You, you know, it's something that probably comes, uh, you know, with your personality as well. well you have a vision you know? about I do, I do, I do have that. I do have that. That's why I like you. I, I feel like I can relate to Arnold a lot. Yeah. You know, and I noticed that you can do so much now without stepping on stage anymore. You know, because we are in a completely different world with different technologies and social media gives you a far more reach and exposure than any stage in the world. And now social media is bigger than IFBB or any other organization. So if you can promote and put yourself uh, up there and be honest and be transparent and do something that comes from your heart, not being driven by making money or making name for yourself, just doing it purely out of passion. This is the only way you can create something really beautiful and relatable. And, and sell it in the end of the day. I agree with completely with you. I mean, money comes and goes. Yes. Money comes and goes, you know. But you know, the way you affect other people, that lasts forever. Your art affects other people. In the old days, the art of bodybuilding affected the way you thought as a kid. 
And that, to me, you know, sometimes your art bothers people and disturbs people. I get that's art too. But art is supposed to affect people to make their own art. And, to, and then you get into, does art imitate life or does life imitate art? That's the whole, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't yeah. Want to <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what bodybuilding was supposed to be. It's not just supposed to be about getting big, about getting strong, and about walking on stage. And I think we need less science and more art. That would be my uh, prognosis or diagnosis. I agree with you. you know? It totally makes sense. You know, I want, I want, what was your mentality and how do you approach pain barrier? Let's say you reach the failure. How would you manage your mind to push your self body beyond that limit? I, I know you had a psychiatrist. I, I haven't seen some film. Yeah, some, 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 yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah, that's a psychiatrist. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him putting you in a state of mind to go into training. Um, I, I told myself when I was real young, I just started to squat. And I made a promise to this young Tom Platts. I said, if you're going to do this bodybuilding thing, if it's this important to you, you cannot be a failure. You cannot leave the gym ever a failure. You have to give it everything you got. And when you think you're done, there's five more reps. Even when you do five reps, there's probably five more reps yet. Okay? And, I, and I told myself, I have to give it this much. I just can't be, because I can't accept the fact. I cannot live with the fact that Tom Platt is a loser. And it disturbs me so much. That I hate that statement so much. I will do anything close to death to be a winner. Okay, so when I squat 50 reps back in the old days for 405, I probably had 30 in me, probably had 25 in me, but somehow, by some act of God, from a miracle, I got 50 reps, okay? But it was a belief system that I cannot, I cannot live with myself. I cannot look in the mirror. I can't walk down the street going, I'm a failure. Oh, I would rather die. I'm serious, I would rather die than be a failure. Life. This should not exist, at least for me, being a failure. I cannot be if you just my life. Just settle for a failure, I would say. So in order to deserve to yeah. breathe on a daily basis, I had to give it that much. And I was willing to give it that much. And a lot of times I came that close to death. This I is did. something you can relate to anything in life. Absolutely. It's the whole life. Yeah. Just refuse to be a failure at anything. If not just totally spent. If you're totally spent at the Olympia, if you're totally spent and gave everything you got, I didn't lose in 81, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You're doing t-shirt, it says 1981, it's gonna say 81 on this thing? Yes, it does. 81. Columbus, you know? Ohio, that's the most memorable Olympia for you, I guess. Well, I have to think that I really lose. Because you, you were right there. I, didn't, I don't have the sand out. Okay, thanks for saying that. I don't have the sand out. Oh, but sand out doesn't matter. You know, when you give 100% and you step on stage, you don't have to acknowledge anyone unless you feel like to. You know, you pay respect when it's due. So, as you said, you this is the sport where you compete against yourself. You know, and you know that you are right there when you need to be. You're a winner, no matter what. Everything that goes along with the Sandow, I have. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys. I think you have way more than that. Well, I don't. I would not want. I would way not more. take the Sandow and give away what I have. Okay, don't. No. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, but you know, you know, I'm very grateful for, for everything that bodybuilding gave me it was a gift and I have to thank you know God for that what you made with bodybuilding of yourself I think that's you know a lot of people come into bodybuilding and they go they then really never make anything out of it but muscles you know I think it created your personality created who you are yeah. it, I mean, instead of just building the muscle you build inner will the thought pattern will never atrophy I mean the thought pattern and the desire to, ex to excel and be the best you can be and be totally spent what a great feeling to leave the gym or to leave the Olympia stage going, I did everything I could possibly do. Wow, I placed fifth or first or second or third. I, I don't care. Tom, do you think, does it have anything to do with genetics, bodybuilding and genetics? Because, you know, a lot of people come and say, oh, I just don't have the genetics for this. But a lot of time they just don't really know how, how much they have to put work so their genetics actually start working. You have to work with what you have. Unless you're, if you're training yourself, you have to work with what you have. You can't work with what you don't have. Genetics does play a role, but you know it's so easy to bow down to genetics. Oh, I don't have genetics. I can't do it. 
when I was a little kid, you know, I knew I didn't have the genetics of Arnold or Zane or, or Robbie, you know, or Corny. Uh, you know, I just, but I knew I had to do it. I don't care. So hell with genetics. I'm going to do it my way. You know, and I, I knew that that was the answer. I mean, it wasn't. And I, it is the answer. You know, the attitude is the answer. Attitude monitors yes. talent. You heard what I just said? Attitude monitors talent. Absolutely. And, and I, I live by that rule. And I don't care what it is. If, I, if I'm, you know, playing chess, which I never do. Or if I'm, you know, <laughs> have to be the best at it, the best I can be. I understand. I'm not trying to beat somebody else, you know. I understand. It's just challenging myself to go get five more reps or two more reps or one more rep. And it's, it's a wonderful experience. I mean, to leave the gym going, even when I see other people do it, like this guy I work out with, Josh or Jacob, to see them leave the gym. And you know Jacob. Yeah. He leaves the gym going, I, he, he, I go, I remember 1975. Let me t it was, I can, I can see that in his eye, you know? And I'm reliving yeah. it like having a child, you know? Not, not that he's my child, but th those feelings are, are still prevalent in my mind now. I think that's why we need to do more squat clinics so you can see more of it. I think people need to know what pure form, pure Absolutely. Is. I think while you're still around here, <laughs> you should you should leave your technique. I think a lot of people out there would, would travel from all around the world to meet you and to learn the pure. You, you know what? There is more to you than than just a physical aspect of bodybuilding. That's why I, I'm not really want to ask you questions. Oh, how? What is the, you, you know, techniques you used? Your approach, mental approach to bodybuilding, is, is where beyond, you, you know, other people, and, and learning that from you and going back to the gym for me, it, uh, for me, it's it's my world where I create my own thing. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I don't feel stressed. I feel creative. You know, I feel inspired there. Even sometimes the workouts are shitty and it doesn't go the way I want to or I'm tired, but I'm enjoying it. I'm living that moment. I don't want to be anywhere else in the world but that. And I want to live through that, pushing yourself constantly to, to something, to that vision. And when you see that happening, your character is changing. It, it, you know, you have to have good to have bad. You have yes. to have evil to have good. You have to have both. White again. You have to have white and black. You know, and in bodybuilding, I remember. Remember, like sometimes I'd go to the, I'd go to a restaurant on Main Street, and I'd be having a fish dinner going. Oh, terrible workout. God, it was disgusting. You know, and I, I never want this to happen again. And it would, but I never, I never want it to happen again. And I'd have a great workout the next workout. And I knew that I had to have those sad days to have those happy days. Yes. And that's that's art. Every artist knows that. And I think as you look at artists like yourself, you realize the true love of art. It's not just doing it for the money. It's doing it for, for life. And it, it, it does. It imitates life. Yes. You know? In fact, you can discuss that forever. And you know, I'd infinite back and forth. Tom, but, what do you think about bodybuilding in the future? And what's, what it's going to go back to? I think we're going to see a guy and a woman create something new that nobody else has ever done. I think it's coming. Because right now, you know, it's, it's, it's similar. It's just people copying, you know. And, but I think we're going to see somebody invent something new like Dorian did. And when Dorian walked on the stage, we never saw that. What the hell is this? We never saw that kind of mass and that kind of size. And I think we're going to see something with quality and shape and style and class that sets that bodybuilder apart than anybody ever. And that's what I'm waiting for. I want to, before I die, I want to see that going, wow. Maybe I passed the you torch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like when I saw yeah. Robbie Robinson as a teenager, my breath was taken away. And I really believe that life is not, not about how many breaths you take. It's about the moments that take your breath away. That's life. Yeah. That's art. That's why I'm in this business. That's why you're in this business. Yes. I know. We're not just in it to look big and get a date. No. You know, it's not about the stuff. No. It's about the love of the game. I mean, you know, and I, and I, I, I live by that rule. You know, and it, I can, I know it's right because it, I, I just know it. And to have somebody like you talk about it with you, to see you take it, I already, I already have taken it. I'm like, wow, that's the guy I want to know. I'm just absorbing it, dude. You don't know. It's like. It's like talking to, you, you know, when you're six and you're looking at that photo and you don't know that guy at all. There's just a guy there. And you get to meet this guy 25 years later. You, you know, I went through so many things in life and I've tried so many things and I have three college degrees. I never thought this bodybuilding thing would be my career, would be my life. And just like for you, it made you, it's making me. 
you, you know it takes me to the places where i didn't dream to go you know there are new horizons and horizons are opening up because i'm putting in the work and i'm, I'm having a bigger vision than you, you know just being a competitive athlete I want to be larger than life in a way. I want to explore life and I feel like bodybuilding is the engine. You know, I don't know if I have a, a superior genetics. I'm not a huge guy because I've seen Danny Padilla when he was 19. It's, that's genetics, you, you, you know. He is unbelievable. He superior. Walk the gym, he'd be tiny and every week he'd get bigger, bigger. He told me. I don't know how he did it. Yeah, but and a lot of people say, oh, that's a, those, are, those are the drugs that were using it. They say, no, it's not. It's, you either have it or you don't. Some people respond very quickly to food uh, and to training. You know, Danny knew how to train. To watch Danny train was a delight. He had fun training. He, every movement was meaningful. It wasn't just 10, it was like 10. He would just, he would, his body would happen in front of my eyes. It was like, it was incredible. And I'll never forget that. The old Second Street, uh, the Gold's Gym on Second Street. Mm -hmm. It was just like, He'd come out, he'd stay skinny on purpose. He would get skinny on purpose. He'd be like a tiny little kid. And he would do that on purpose and not eat. And then start eating like a bodybuilder. He'd just like, oh, wow. This, it was just like a flower blossoming, you know? And yeah. It was, it was the most incredible thing I ever saw. I'm going to ask you a question. He is, you were with him on, on the stage in 1981. Yeah. What do you think you were against him? Well, I think Danny could have won, but, you know, could have. Here's, here's the funny thing is, and I, 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 I'll tell you this. I didn't know who was on stage. I don't know until maybe like a few years ago. I go, oh, Danny was in that. Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> when he was in it, wow. Waller was in it. Yeah. Because I was so into my own zone. And this is what body, modern day bodybuilders, they get backstage and they go, oh, look at her, look at him. And they give it away. Yeah. When I was 81, I was so hypnotized within myself. It's a selfish thing too, but I knew this is my time. I don't care who shows up. I don't care if God shows up. It's my time. Okay, I mean that not disrespectfully, but I, there were some bodybuilders that were, you know, that were better than me, for sure. Uh, Danny had the potential to win that night. I don't think he believed it, though. I don't know if he believed it entirely. Um, his, I, I could sense that a little bit. He was ready to take second and or third. I'm like, you know, and uh, I was, you know, I congratulated Franco when he won. And uh, that's the risk you take. When you stand on stage, you take the risk of losing. Um, but I don't know, that night was so special. I, 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 could, I would train 25 more years for one more night like that with no money, forget about it. Just for one more night. I mean, you know, imagine, it's like the, the people in the audience. And yes. like, it was like, I was, they were, I was one of them. They were one of me. We're all together in this. It was like the love of the game was so, so thick in the air. You could smell it, you could taste it. You know, and Ricky Wayne came up to me afterward. Ricky Wayne was yeah. old and you know, he would interview me and he wanted to tell me something bad about Franco. I just, Franco should have, great champion. Franco was a great bodybuilder. He should have placed a little bit lower tonight and I should have placed a little higher. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here with everybody. You know, I, I just said things diplomatically. I didn't plan that. I, I've seen that. It just came out that way, you know. Uh, I was thrilled to be on stage with the best in the world and take my place amongst them, um, you know. And I wasn't the most genetically gifted, the most genetically superior, but I don't care. Damn it, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna make it happen. And people go, oh my God, how did he do that? We are very strong in our mind. If you want something bad enough, you'll figure a way out. Tom, what would you, what would be your message to everyone around the world watching us, to all the young kids that come into bodybuilding? Don't ever let somebody tell you that you're not good enough, you know? And I, I was talking, I, I was talking to this young girl on the phone today. I'm a recruiter. I'm a corporate recruiter. I help people find their way in life. And I, I told her, don't let anybody ever tell you that you're not good enough. Okay? And I, and I made an appointment with her to interview her, to put her in a position, a corporate position. And so many young people think that they can't, or they, they're not, they don't have the potential, uh, or if somebody else is better, forget everything about it. I mean, you know, if you really want something bad enough, if you really, really want something bad enough, you'll figure out a way to get there. It may not be exactly what you had in mind, like the Olympia third place wasn't exactly what I had in mind. Okay, but I'll take third place. Okay, and I'll figure it out. And, you know, people don't think about third place, they just think about that night and the energy, as I do. And it, I, I really believe if you want something bad enough, you can will it to happen. Muscle growth, genetically disturbing your genetics and changing, 
I mean, when I look at pictures of myself as a kid versus 81, like, things happen, you know? And it, I, I didn't really how it happened, it just happened. It wasn't, but inside myself, I was demanding and insisting, and, and I wasn't about to say, hey, I hope it happens. It's gonna happen right now or the muscle's gonna break off. Either one, God, what do you think? Let's go, okay? And it worked. And I, I really believe that attitude is everything. Thank you. Not, not very often do you get a great leap with great attitude and great genetics. Usually they're the, they're the superstars. They exist too. Okay. You know, Tom, I, I want to say thank you because, um, you know, doing this interview, you, you really think of the questions and you try to play it, play it out somehow, right? For me, listening to you right now, it's changing my perspective on life because I come from a very humble environment where people tell you you can't be someone, you can't go somewhere, you, you know, and I come from poverty. So I was already kind of put the limitations on me automatically, you know, and I fight those limitations every single day. And listening to you, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I listen to some of your tapes before I go on my leg days, you know, because they inspire me so much. So I thank you so much for, for actually doing this and getting involved with me and with Golden Aesthetics and, and, and sharing your knowledge. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, help you with the squat clinic so we can invite people from around the world yeah. so we can teach them, yes. And not only the, the form of squat, just the pure art of bodybuilding. Thank you so much, Tom. That's a big pleasure and a big honor, man. Thank you so much.